The Russian village of the 19th century is usually portrayed as an idyllic picture of high moral principles, birch trees, round dances, highly moral girls and boys, domestroy. Where is our 21st century, liberated by the sexual revolution? But get ready, what really were the morals in the Russian village you can simply shock, and notes of ethnographers of the 19th century will make many guardians of morality blush. Today we will talk about the intimate life of Russian peasants of the 19th century. How to make love in a hut full of people. What will amaze you about the games of the village youth? What was most appreciated in girls? How will you be horrified by the harems of landlords and why it was not easier to live with your own husband? Where did the saying, hitting means loving, come from? And what is Snokachestvo? So, meet our heroine Olga Semyonova Tienshanskaya, daughter of the famous traveler and geographer. She was still very young when the boy artist in love with her committed suicide because she did not respond to his feelings. The girl was devastated and only a few years later fell in love herself. It was also an artist, a friend of the family who taught her brothers and sisters to draw. He also fell in love with Olga and she was not herself from happiness, but her lover died unexpectedly. Once in such cases, girls went to a monastery, but it was the end of the 19th century, and Olga decided to devote the rest of her life to the service of science, the new deity of mankind. But if her famous father spent his life exploring distant lands, his daughter discovered Terra Incognita, close to home, in a village in the Ryazan province, where the family spent summers. She was only 23 when she received a silver medal from the Russian Geographical Society for the unique Russian folk songs she had collected. After that, she plunged headlong into collecting ancient festivals, rituals and fairy tales, saving them from oblivion. But the most famous was her other ethnographic project. At the turn of the century, together with another ethnographer, Konstantin Nikolesky, she decided to study and describe the authentic life of Russian peasants, including their love life. The researchers threw themselves into the people. They did not yet know that this work would require great fortitude, and the results would cause a huge shock even centuries later. It is generally believed that the Russian Empire had very strict morals, no match for today's promiscuity. But who among us has not heard that it would be time to return to the highly moral 19th century and finally get rid of the consequences of the sexual revolution of the 20th century? Except that there seems to have been no need for the sexual revolution in the Russian Empire. Of course, the mores differed somewhat in different provinces, but the majority of peasant girls and boys were quite free both in love and in the choice of a spouse, and the mores there were such that today's youth would seem to be a model of morality. This is what Olga Semyonova Tienshanskaya saw. Now you can't find a chaste boy, and there are very few such girls. In some villages there is still the custom to marry very young girls of 12 to 14 years for boys corresponding to them in age. Now such conspiracies are often broken when the bride and groom become adults, and if not, so 14 to 15 year old brides 16 year old groom begin to live together, until their adulthood. It happens, of course, after some streets. These very streets are analogous to modern nightclubs somewhere on the outskirts of the village, where young people met and fell in love. This is how Olga Semyonova Tienshanskaya describes the streets. Girls from the whole village and some young women, especially those whose husbands are away, gather in the street. It usually happens at dusk. The girls come not only from their own village, but also from other villages. When all the elders have gone to bed, whoever wants to goes to the bushes, to the hayloft, and makes contact there. Similarly, when there is a party, you go to the barn. Of course, the elders often scold and beat their daughters for such contacts, but nothing happens to the boys. So much for high morals. Not only that, but in villages where it is customary to marry off sons and give away daughters in order to prevent them from making independent choices, young men specially meet with a girl to fix their intention to marry her. 
father and mother are more likely to agree with the son's choice if he says that there is already a sin between him and his chosen one. Of course, such behavior of young people was treated differently in different provinces. Somewhere, as in the Archangel's province, the innocence of a girl was not given importance. There is a testimony of a resident of the Tombov province. The honor of a girl is set low, she who has lost it loses almost nothing when she marries. And here is another testimony of a contemporary in the Vyatka and Vologda provinces, where at the end of the dances young people leave in pairs, and here chastity is not given much importance. However, the couples often got married afterwards. People said, what sin is it if we cover it with a wedding ring? Besides, it was not considered improper to have sexual intercourse with the bridegroom. But in Voronezh province, a spoiled bride could be beaten to a pulp and then forced to crawl around the church on her knees three times. Such shame was not easy to bear. It is interesting to note that women and girls used to escort men home from the street, not the other way around as it is today. It was believed that a man had a higher status and a bridegroom had to be won over. In winter, instead of streets, there were vichorki. Girls would get together and rent a hut from a widow for the night. Often there were several such vichorki in a village, and groups of boys would go from one to another. Here is what our heroine, having witnessed such events, writes. The boys bring vodka, sweets, and spoil the girls and the mistress of the hut. They sing songs, drink, eat, dance, play cards and games. Monks, Susdi, Cossacks, all these games are reduced to kissing. The hut was incredibly crowded, everyone was sitting on each other's laps, and again, the boys were sitting on the girls' laps, not the other way around. They all kissed endlessly, as eyewitnesses described such gatherings, to the point of pain in the lips. At that time in Russia there were a variety of kissing techniques that we do not know today. If you and I were to attend such a party today, it would probably be quite wild for us. But Russian peasants certainly did not play the famous, spin the bottle. The bottle was a valuable object and no one would risk it. The game, spin the bottle, appeared in the urban environment somewhere before the First World War, but the principle of the evening was the same. Some games played by young people, especially on Christmas Eve, would make any of our contemporaries blush. For example, in the game with the innocuous name of Cowshed, a naked man was led around the room on all fours, and the girls had to milk him for one place. They were made to do things that embarrassed them, and those who refused could be severely beaten. And this is just one of many such entertainments that would shock contemporaries. There were many witnesses to all this, the elderly and children who looked in the windows. If a girl had a boyfriend, he could take over the beating and exempt her from participating in such a game, and if there was no protector, then one had to fulfill all the requirements. Not to go to such events was impossible, girl turned into an outcast. The culmination of all these games was a game called Gaski. For the first time, Gaski, described in the 16th century Italian traveler Lactantius Riccolini, who visited one of these events. After gathering in someone's house to dance, men and women extinguished a candle after dancing, after which each had sexual intercourse with the girl who was closer. That night when Raccolini was on the Gaski, the candle was extinguished and lit five times. Whether the traveler directly participated in the ritual, he didn't report. This is the kind of entertainment. This is the kind of freedom of manners. At the same time Olga Semyonova Tien Shanskaya notes, a young husband, convinced that a girl is not chaste on her first wedding night, sometimes beats her severely, which serves as a prelude to further beatings, sometimes for several months. The most important criterion for an enviable bride is the working quality, the more working the better. A girl should be smart, healthy, handy, humble, and work wherever she is told it was said in the village. That's why girls were valued as tall, strong, black-browed. The pale ones were considered sickly, 
and it aroused the worst suspicion that the young woman would not work well for the good of the family. At the same time, Olga Semyonova Tien Shanskaya notes, women in our region are certainly beautiful, tall and not badly built at the age of 15 or 16. After 16 their figure deteriorates due to hard work. The earlier a girl marries, the more emaciated she becomes. But the most beautiful women are not considered beautiful among the peasants. When it comes to choosing a bride or a mistress, the peasants' tastes are not at all like ours. We like strict or clean lines and contours, while any peasant would prefer a large, blurred maiden or woman. Bridegrooms also like black-browed and tall. But a man older than six to eight years was considered old, and brides, as Olga writes, cry and are unhappy if by parental discretion they have to marry such a man, and their friends laugh at them. Meanwhile, some 18 to 20 year old guy does not think to take offense that his future wife is two or even four years older than him. Also did not like redheads, they were considered secretly treacherous and evil. A 20 year old girl was considered already old. As they said, now the grooms will run away. At the same time, the girl was looked upon in her native family as a labor force, and therefore they were not in a hurry to marry her off. However, peasants got such freedom in choosing a bride and groom after the abolition of serfdom, in the second half of the 19th century. Before that, marriage issues were often decided by the landlord. There are memories when Baron gathering all the young people and assigning couples at random, there was no opportunity to argue or resist, so they lived all their lives with the one Baron chose. But that was not the worst. If you think that we are only talking about the mores of the peasants, we would like to disappoint you. Landlords used to have real harems on their estates. Poor servant girls were absolutely powerless and could do nothing. There were many harems, and the upper class did not consider it particularly shameful. So, the Decemberist Osip Julian Gorsky bought three serf girls and forced them to live with him. To quote the case materials, the vile debauchery, bad treatment forced the unfortunate girls to flee from him and seek protection from the government, but the case was hushed up by Count Miloradovich. However, the landowner of the Kiev province, Viktor Strashinsky, abused more than 500 of his serfs. None of his peasant women escaped close acquaintance with the baron. Even his own daughters from unfortunate serfs became his victims. The notorious Lev Ismailov from the Tula province, who put under the key 30 of the most beautiful girls who satisfied his lust, supplied girls as a gift to visiting guests. Rumors of his wild cruelty reached the authorities, but he was only suspended from the management of the estate. Fortunately, after the abolition of serfdom, such harems became a thing of the past. But if you think that now everything is fine for peasant women, they can even choose their own husbands, unlike noble women or merchants, then the horror begins. Imagine, a peasant woman went to the streets and Vachorki, fell in love, visited the bushes, got a marriage proposal. That's it, life is good? No. For starters, let's imagine a hut in which she will move, under one roof often lived several generations, including father-in-law and mother-in-law, still single brothers and sisters of the spouse, well, and their children, ten people in one hut. How could there be intimacy in such a collective? All sleeping places were strictly assigned, sleeping anywhere except on the table. But the head of the family and his wife had a private bed. With all this, intimacy in the orthodox peasant family was an intimate matter and required privacy, but where to get it? That's why they came to the hayloft in the warm season, no romance, just an opportunity for privacy. When it was cold outside, bathhouses helped. However, another possibility can be seen in the paintings of pre-revolutionary artists, to close from all, the spouses, however, only the eldest in the family, could on his bed used for this something like this canopy. European peasants, whose life was even more complicated and whose morals were exactly the same, used closet beds for privacy. On intimate life were imposed many prohibitions, on Fridays, Saturdays, 
spouses were not allowed to love each other. As well as on numerous church holidays and all fasts, as well as on days of mourning and a number of other less important occasions. Less than half of the days of the year were set aside for carnal pleasures, and all details of lovemaking had to be confessed to the priest, who could punish and impose penance if in his opinion, something went wrong. With all this, children were born a lot, for what others, especially mother-in-law, as Olga Semyonova Tien Shanskaya writes, condemned the women themselves. I will quote her, rarely a woman does not give birth to eight, or even ten to twelve children, and three to four of them remain alive. During pregnancy and childbirth, a woman was not released from even the hardest work, so women gave birth right in the field. I will quote our heroine once again, from hard work, immediately after childbirth a rare woman does not have more or less degree of uterine prolapse. The case is extremely painful and was considered something common and happened even in young girls from hard work. It was said that her stomach was torn out. Many terrible details, which are described in the book of Olga Semenova Tien Shanskaya, I cannot even describe to you, it is nightmarish, if you want to read yourself, Life of Ivan, it is a horror. The 19th century publicist Andrei Shingarev wrote that, quote, beatings of pregnant women, as well as beatings in general, are not rare, although women think that it is not a woman's business to think about a man's beatings and should not talk about them, but from each of them you can hear that the husband beats and beats often. In our village, a small, scrawny man used to beat his healthy, tall wife in the following way. The small man would climb on a bench, the submissive woman would come up to him, and he would slap her on the cheeks. The 19th century writer Alexander Levitov, who spent his childhood in a village deacon's hut, wrote that it was not uncommon for a husband to beat his wife for some trivial reason or simply for being in a bad mood. They beat their wives extremely cruelly, according to testimonies more cruelly than a horse or a dog. In the newspapers of the 19th century, it is not uncommon to read. In the village of Alexandrovka of such and such Yezd, on February 21st, a peasant woman of 30 years died from beatings inflicted by her husband, and this is 1884. And here are the data already in 1926, the local historian conducted a study in the Voronezh province, interviewed peasants, is it necessary to beat a woman? So about 60% of the peasants questioned answered in the affirmative, considering it a study, and only 40 said that it is not necessary. Such study was perceived by the village society as the husband's duty, the wife should fear and respect the man, and without such deadly study she would not respect her husband. What is most shocking is that the women themselves, who were subjected to such brutal violence on a daily basis, believed that it was a manifestation of men's love. That's where, beating means love, comes from. Our heroine Olga Semyonova Tienshanskaya was horrified by everything she learned. But as a scientist, she carefully recorded everything. Once on the pages of her book she asks the question, was there love for a woman in the Russian village at all, and how was it expressed? And I quote, I have been interested in this question for a long time, and at one time I thought that it was impossible since outward expressions of tenderness from a husband to his wife were practically non-existent, even among newlyweds, but lately I think a little differently. Petruka feels sorry for his wife. Is there such a happy woman in the whole village? She quotes the peasant women of the village. I knew that Petruka does not drink and does not beat his wife, writes Olga. Unfortunately, such a Petruka and such a relationship between a man and a woman are terribly rare. In fact, this is the only example I know. Creepy. I must say that the morals of the European peasants of that time were not softer. They beat their wives just the same, and they lived much poorer. Honoré de Balzac, on the basis of personal observations, wrote in 1847, the Russian peasant is a hundred times happier than the 20 million who make up the French people. The sacred bond of marriage in the peasant community did not interfere with anything, and extramarital affairs were the norm. The wives of those who served in the army and the wives of those who went to the cities to work in the trades had lovers. 
Our heroine believed that it was the men's departure for work that corrupted the village. She wrote, A man goes to work and has mistresses there, but a woman can have a lover at home. There is no professional debauchery, but it is very easy to buy any woman with money and gifts. One woman very naively admitted, I gave birth to a son, and all for nothing, for a dozen apples. Olga writes, Women and girls are very fond of going for apples in the orchards of the tenants. Apples are bought, or rather exchanged for eggs, and sometimes for themselves. Such promiscuity is confirmed by the 19th century writer Alexander Engelhardt. The manners of the village women and girls are incredibly simple. Money, a shawl under certain circumstances, as long as no one knows. That's what everybody does. Such amazingly simple manners were not condemned, a lover did not make a woman a libertine. Olga Semyonova Tien Shanskaya gives the following definition of a promiscuous woman. A promiscuous woman is a girl or a woman who has several lovers. Such lovers sometimes conspire to teach their mistress. If she is a girl, they smear tar on her gate. And if she is a woman, they beat her, then lift her shirt over her head, tie her up so that her head is in a sack and she is naked up to her waist, and let her walk through the village. A girl who has a lover is not considered promiscuous, and her gates are not smeared with tar. Our heroine tells about another remarkable custom. Sometimes in spring, before the working season, several women and girls from a village go on a pilgrimage to Veronash or to Sergius of the Trinity. Parents and husbands know very well what this pilgrimage is, but a few women and girls who have conspired together form a force that is difficult to fight. They go. They sleep in different villages in the name of Christ, and so much more. Oh what times, oh what customs! Today is simply shocking and another, quite ordinary and commonplace for that time, a phenomenon that existed in all parts of the Russian Empire, when the head of the family entered into a relationship with the wife of his son. It was so widespread that there was even a term, Snokachestvo. It is believed that one of the reasons was early marriages, when 12 to 13 year old boys were deliberately married by their fathers to 16 to 17 year old brides. It is said that in this way the father-in-law brought the girl he liked into the family and soon sent his son to the Volga or to the city to work. Here is information from the Oral Province in 1899. Snokachestvo is widespread here because husbands go to work and see their wives only twice a year while the father-in-law stays at home and disposes of them as he sees fit. A young woman was left alone in a strange house, and her father-in-law used all means and persuasions and gifts and promises of easy work, and in case of refusal the woman's life became unbearable, she was given the most difficult work, she was severely beaten, there were cases when she was locked up in a cellar or a cold barn. As peasant women who survived the harassment of their father-in-law recalled, he took revenge on her by telling his son all sorts of nasty things about her, such as that she was unfaithful to him, and her husband severely beat the innocent woman upon his arrival. According to the 19th century Russian ethnographer Maximov, Snokachestvo was most pronounced in the provinces of Tobolsk, Perm, Vyatka, Poltava, and Kharkiv. If you want to say like me, I don't believe it, our heroine is telling lies about the peasants. I can disappoint you. All her information is confirmed by numerous other sources. And Olga Semenova to Enshanskaya can hardly be accused of disliking the Russian people. She devoted her life to preserving the immaterial treasures of the Russian people. Old songs and rituals, ritual biscuits, clothes, embroidery and lace. Our heroine preserved for history much that would have been lost forever without her. She praised the extraordinary lace of Russian peasants to such an extent that it began to be bought at the court and even abroad. In general, she is far from being Russophobic, but one cannot accuse Russian peasants of being unusually lecherous or cruel. Exactly the same morals prevailed in the peasant environment in Europe at that time, and generally it is good that all this is in the past. Well, our heroine Olga Semyonova Tien Shanskaya died, unfortunately, quite early, at the age of 37. Her work about the true life of Russian peasants called Ivan's Life 
was published by her friends and relatives.